Thank you guys so much for joining us. Um, we'll start with talking to Stuart a bit about Next Chapter. So Next Chapter is a program to create apprenticeships and ultimately full-time positions for formerly incarcerated people. And um, this is something that we developed internally at Slack, but now we have a number of partners, Dropbox, Square, and, and Zoom are some examples, um, and bringing more people on. So this is not a you know scalable uh, solution to the general problem of finding employment and opportunities for formerly incarcerated people. Um, and this is one little niche, but it's creating real jobs, you know, the actual software engineering jobs at an actual tech company where people have actual stock options. Um, and the result of that, I think, is, um, you know, pretty, pretty profound, not just on the people in the program, but on their network, on their friends, on their, their families. And ultimately, I think that's one of the intentions, and there's a whole bunch, but one of the intentions from, from my perspective um, you know, just given the enormous amount of wealth creation and the, um, the opportunities that exist inside companies like Slack, we wanted to ensure that there was access for a whole bunch of people because the people will pull in their networks. Yeah. Well, I want to talk about all of that in a little bit more depth. But first, uh, let's bring Kenyatta into this conversation. It, it's great to have you with us here. Kenyatta, can you just tell us a bit about your path and how you got involved with this effort now leading Next Chapter for Slack? Sure. Um, I come into this work through my own incarceration. I was incarcerated for uh, 20 plus years in the California prison system, um, most recently for being an ex-felon in possession of a firearm. Um, I worked really hard um, while I was in prison to turn my life around, got involved in a bunch of programs. One notable program being the Last Mile program, which is a software development training program inside. Um, helped start that program there. And uh, through my participation in uh, in the last mile, I was released from prison in 2013. And through my participation in the last mile, I earned an internship, um, worked there for about five years, uh, a company called Rocket Space. And then I joined the last mile team in 2018 as a reentry um, manager, you know, helping folks, um, you know, return back to the community. And, you know, the, the work has just been really super fulfilling for me. Obviously, you know, I received a lot of support, you know, to help me turn my life around. And so to be able to help other people do the same thing is, you know, a blessing. That's terrific. And Kenyatta, can you just speak a bit more from that personal experience? We all know the horrible statistics about recidivism, which speaks to just how little support so many formerly incarcerated people have when they're reentering uh, civilian life. Can you talk about the importance of, of a job? Now, a job at Slack is great, but just that stable job as, as a stepping stone to really a productive reentry to society. How important is it? Oh, it's, it's critically important. I think having a job um, for anyone, let alone somebody coming out of prison, is critically important, you know, to, to being able to survive in this world out here. Um, but for people who are coming home, uh, having, having a job, having financial stability is super important. Um, having resources to be able to find housing, clothing, food, just the basic necessities that we need in life is really important. Without that, um, the chances of recidivism increase dramatically. I think there's been a ton of studies on that. Um, but in the first three years, if people don't have gainful employment, you know, the recidivism rates go up. And so um, we found that, um, you know, the, the folks that we work with, uh, you know, they're, they're really excited about having these opportunities to work. And, um, you know, we're just trying to create more of them. Thank you for sharing that, Kenyatta. Stuart, can you tell us about where this program came from? Because I got to believe you got a bunch of things going on as the CEO of a, of a fast growing company. How is it that you came to be involved in this issue and ultimately help get Next Chapter going? Uh, I think the initial spark of awareness um, comes from someone who's had a big influence on, on a lot of people, Brian Stevenson. And I heard him speak at a conference um, 2014, 2015, somewhere around there. And the uh, the Slack holiday gift for employees that year included a copy of his book, Just Mercy. And um, obviously something that I, I highly recommend to, to anyone. Um, and, you know, I had had some um, kind of loose, broad interest um, without a lot of knowledge around uh, criminal justice reform for a long time. Um, 
but this really catalyzed it for me. And I think as an indirect result of that, I ended up going to San Quentin to visit uh, people in the program that Kenyatta was just talking about um, for the last mile. And it was just really incredible to see because there was um, people I met there. And in fact, three of them, three of the people I met on this trip um, ended up working at Slack much later. But uh, here are people in prison and learning how to be software developers and they're not allowed access to the internet. So, you know, a solid third of software development is Googling stuff to figure out what you're supposed to do. And they don't have that. A lot of people were designing apps um, who had never uh, you know, really experienced the smartphone life revolution that happened um, because they had been incarcerated the whole time, people making stuff for Facebook who had never actually used Facebook. So it's just really impressive uh, kind of the, the ingenuity. Yeah. Kenyatta, can you speak to this both from your perspective as someone who's gone through this personally, but also through your work with Last Mile and Next Chapter? You know, I think it's one thing for people to imagine, you know, just how difficult it will be to to, to serve time and then and then try to re-enter. But then to know that there are these structural impediments that are preventing them from actually getting these jobs, which you correctly said were so, so important. Uh, I, I, just how big are these impediments and, and what needs to be changed to, to make it easier for people to get those jobs and really re-enter and have these productive lives? This is a huge problem that, that we face. Um, and it really revolves around a lot of the stuff that Brian Stevenson speaks to around justice. Um, when we take a look at uh, the system, the way it's aligned against people who are formerly incarcerated, there's a, a really big stigma there that people have to overcome. It's, it's, it's a big challenge to, to have to make the paradigm shift from an incarcerated setting into, you know, the corporate world or a tech environment. But when you have this stigma that's associated with that, like Stuart had mentioned, you know, what, what kind of crime was he in, you know, this person involved in? That's a huge hurdle to get over. And, you know, these stigmas really revolve around fear. And our program is in large part um, uh, constructed to help dismantle a lot of those fears. And, um, the talk that, that Ali gave with, uh, with Stuart is, is a big part of that, you know, um, humanizing folks, bringing the humanity back into the equation. People that go to prison are just that, they're people. And it's important for us to really focus on the potential that people have. I mean, we've, we've come up with a thousand ways to make sure that this plastic bottle gets a new life, but far too few to make sure that somebody getting out of prison does, right? And so, what we're trying to do is is double down and really focus on people's potential and how can we build that and at the same time change the narrative shift the narrative about you know what people coming out of prison are capable of um i talk to people every single day and most people would never you know think that i had been to prison but you know when you get to talk to people um and you get to you know really see who people are and and what they're capable of it really makes a difference and you know, um, we've gotten a ton of support from the folks at Slack. Um, it's been a, a challenge to overcome some of those fears there. But when you think about it, when you go through a process of overcoming a fear, if you've ever had somebody help you through a process of overcoming a fear, that change is really long lasting and those relationships run deep. And um, we've been really fortunate to have that kind of support at Slack, people that really want to roll up their sleeves and really address these systemic issues that we see today. And uh, we're fortunate to have that, and we look um, we look forward to doing a lot more of this work in the future. Kenyatta, when you think about what you would like to see from other companies, what is your call to action for corporate America right now when it comes to uh, working with the formerly incarcerated, and what you can point to that is possible through a program like Next Chapter? Well, I think it's it's important for. Um, to create space to have these kind of conversations, right? I think that um, Stuart uh, bringing somebody like Ali Tambora to Slack to have a conversation around the issue of criminal justice reform is, is, is a big deal, right? So having, creating space to, to, to have these kind of conversations, a safe place where people can ask questions um, that they normally might not ask. Um, I also think that, uh, you know, that's just one point uh, where folks can get proximate, but I do think that there's other ways that folks can get proximate to the issues as well, too. Um, Stuart mentioned, you know, that there are folks that uh, from Slack that actually went to San Quentin and actually met people at the prison. 
that goes a long way, right? So getting proximate, creating space. And I think um, just being bold, being bold, having the courage to, to, to take this step to overcome the fear that's associated with the stigmas uh, around people who are formerly incarcerated. To me, those are, are three just critical steps that need to be taken if anyone wants to get involved in this kind of work. And I would also include, call next chapter. We're, we're happy to help. There you go. Uh, and Stuart, it, it, you identified a lot of the very real obstacles to, to getting something like this done inside a company, from employee resistance to regulatory challenges. Given all that, why is it worth it? Why should companies actually spend you know, precious time, energy, resources on this issue of all the ones out there? You know, part of it, I think, has to come internally from people. So there's a, what is the saying? Something like, uh, we should judge a society by how it treats its most vulnerable people. I think that's a it seems like a Christian belief, but it also seems like something that has a broad appeal to anyone who's not Christian. I mean, it's just like it, it's a great principle. Um, and while there is like, employee uncertainty, the broad base of employees were very enthusiastic about this. And I think that it would, the uncertainty was something to be overcome. But um, as Kenyatta just mentioned, we literally had hundreds of people at this point go out to uh, to San Quentin. Um, and I think about 100, over 100 employees involved in some way with the Next Chapter program. And that can be um, you know, working with the the uh, people in their uh, apprenticeships to kind of tutor, give supplemental skills, kind of um, almost like social etiquette lessons on corporate life, because a lot of people just had no exposure to office jobs before. Um, and I, I think it's worth it ultimately because we have to take a, a pretty broad spectrum approach to, um, I was going to say combating inequality, but that's, I don't think that's quite the right, combating is not the right, uh, the right word for it. Certainly over the last year since the pandemic, we've seen just an enormous exacerbation of the uh, of existing problems. Um, and you know, I, don't, I don't think it's good for society, good for anyone, but I think it's also just... Um, it's tough for people uh, who have the kind of the luck, the privilege, the luxury um, to shut off the, the part of their mind or their soul that would make them feel, um, you know, like a lot of shared personhood with the people who are not so lucky. But I think we created a lot more of those people. Um, so when I mentioned before that we're trying to take a, a pretty broad experimental approach, um, the next chapter is one of those experiments and I think it's one that worked out really well. And um, the reason I think it's worth it is because we're gonna see a, you know, another generation of people who go on to become leaders in other companies to start their own companies, who bring their friends and family and their networks more broadly into the, the industry and you know create a series of opportunities that really knocks down um, uh, walls and kind of you know, sp spreads out more widely. So the last thing I would say is um, I think the net impact on employees is a lot of pride. It creates an opportunity for them to contribute, you know, to volunteer. Um, and I think just inspires them to look at other places in their life where they could make a difference. I'd forgotten about this, but uh, in the early days of the pandemic, Kenyatta got a an opinion piece in USA Today that was like lessons I learned from San Quentin that are applicable to people in the lockdown. Um, and one of the, the principal points he mentioned was purpose. I mean, people, um, maybe especially in times of uncertainty, but um, people need to feel like there is some purpose to their life and their, their activity. And um, giving a broader base of employees some sense of that, I think is really powerful, um, impactful. It creates a better culture, it creates a lot of morale, it creates a lot of enthusiasm, tighter bonds, more trust, you know, all the things that I think that leaders are trying to cultivate anyway. And Kenyatta, you know this population as well as anyone, both personally and now professionally. What's the lost opportunity cost? If the corporate America and the rest of society doesn't fulsomely engage the formerly incarcerated in a country that has a higher incarceration rate per capita than any other developed nation in the world, what are we missing? What are we going to lose? Uh, we just lose on, on all levels. Uh, I think first and foremost, what comes to mind is people, you know, we have millions and millions of people who are, you know, just ostracized and can't find work because 
uh, you know, because of their background. I think the Kellogg Foundation did a study long, not long ago where they show they like there's there's like so much money that's being left on the table, GDP that's being left on the table because we're not putting people to work. And uh, that's just a shame. You know, we can do better. And um, I think there's a lot of and when you think about that um, and how that impacts people uh, in the home, um, it, it, you know, this becomes a revolving door where people don't get work. They go back to prison. Um, people lose hope. Uh, families are broken. Um, we as taxpayers pay, you know, extraordinary amounts of money for a system that's broken. And so um, we can do much, much better. I think that, uh, you know, we have um, the resources. We just need the courage, you know, to take these steps. Um, I think next chapter is providing a great example of what that looks like. But as Stuart mentioned earlier, it's a, it's a, it's a drop in the bucket. And we need we need to get uh, we need to have more more examples like this to help continue to 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 move the needle in the right direction. Well, keep up the good work, Kenyatta Stewart. Um, as 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 we wrap it up, talk to us about what this program is going to look like going forward. Slack has obviously agreed to be acquired by Salesforce. I know through decades of covering mergers and acquisitions that cultures can change. What, what assurances have Mark Benioff of Salesforce, the company Salesforce, given you about the ability for Slack to continue and maybe even expand a program like Next Chapter? Well, we haven't been through every detail, um, but uh, you know, Salesforce has had for a number of years trust as one of its um, principal values, and more recently, equality. So, you know, I think this is something that's very much in alignment with the publicly stated values of, of Salesforce, but also what they talk about internally. The deal hasn't closed yet, so there's a, you know, still a lot for me to, to learn. Um, but what, you know, one of my hopes is that we can help scale it. That we're, I think, 2,600 employees or something like that, and, and, and uh, Salesforce is 55,000, so it's a much bigger company. Um, and when we talk about the future more broadly, I'd just love to get more companies participating. And the group that's participating so far Obviously, you know, us, Square, um, Dropbox, Zoom, um, a bunch of really successful startups. And uh, I think we probably need to have a certain amount of scale to take something like this on. So uh, among the things that we'd like to be able to do is to make it easy so that you don't have to get to the, the scale of thousands of employees before you're able to, to participate. You know, some companies that have hundreds of employees um, as well. But the big win, I think, is to get um, the, the largest class of, of companies, those companies that have tens of thousands of employees or even hundreds of thousands of employees to really participate because that's the only way to get scale. Well, there's also uh, an issue that I think Stuart mentioned at the top of the conversation, which is, which is a, a really fundamental one. And that is the fact that so much wealth in our society today is created through the stock market and through tech companies, and that by giving formerly incarcerated men and women uh, an access, an opportunity to this industry, we might actually spread the wealth in ways that can contribute to repairing some of the underlying societal issues that create such high incarceration rates in the first place. Kenyatta, when you think about what Next Chapter is doing, how critical is that piece to the overall puzzle here? I think it's uh, very, very important. Um, I could just give you a personal example. So, for example, um, you know, our our the folks that go through our program, they go from earning pennies on the dollar in an incarcerated setting to, you know, making good money out here. And they're able to break this cycle of generational poverty that exists in a lot of the families, you know, of people living in, in incarcerated settings. And so. I see this as like a, a, a huge step in helping break that cycle and actually, you know, creating an opportunity for folks to, to build more wealth, actually. So I don't know if that really answered your question, but um, that's kind of my thoughts on it. You want me to jump in I, on you that? Know, I, you, you're welcome to. I thought he nailed the answer. So it's yeah, I, I, I think he did too. So I yeah. think we Kenyatta, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right.